Hi, I'm Jonathan, a member of the Xbox research team, and I'm here to talk to you all about a method we found helpful, and one that we've started to even see some other teams at Microsoft try out. Long-term iterative testing and evaluation. I'll set the stage today by comparing it to write and standard usability studies in order to introduce the method and demonstrate where it's most helpful. Then I'll talk through the history of the method to show how it's evolved in our hands over the past decade, with three examples of products where it has unlocked our ability to collect high-quality usability data, and a couple examples of how I've been able to leverage it to evolve my UR tactics in real time. Finally, I'll use one of those products to talk about signals that can help you understand when to pause a light study or graduate to another method. I assume we're all familiar with both standard usability and rapid iterative testing and evaluation, or right studies. But let's ask the question, when do you want to do a right study? The answer is pretty simple, when you want to facilitate rapid iteration over a short time frame. Write works by running quick rounds of usability to identify issues, followed by resolution attempts by the team, followed by evaluation of their fixes. The example here is from one of our report templates. It shows how you can identify issues on the first day of a study with three participants. Those are shown in red. And then you can track whether issues have resolved or not. Those are shown in green. And then by the third day of the study, hopefully the team has resolved all or most of the issues you encountered on the first day. But right and standard usability can break down in the face of common challenges. The first of these is complex systems. They both struggle when you have systems that are too far apart to catch every problem in a two-hour window of natural product interactions, or too many to run a series of dedicated studies. This is a frequent problem in games, but it's not unique to them. Anything complex enough to require mastery over long-term engagement, Excel, Tableau, and SQL database, breaks the Nielsen curve. The second is chaotic projects. When projects are on fire, teams can struggle just to commit to deadlines for a usability study. And when they're already behind, it can be hard for them to take out a week to watch a full slate of usability studies or plan to commit one to two weeks to iterate on a specific feature. And this can lead to feeling like there's a risk of wasting valuable opportunities, whether that's special participant types or concerns about scheduling and recruiting for full studies when a team is on fire and at high risk of missing build delivery deadlines, potentially over and over again. So how does Light help us get around this? In order to understand that, we'll need, first we'll need to understand this chart, which shows us the Nielsen curve. Most of us are probably familiar with it, but for those who aren't, it's a mathematic model of the percentage of usability issues you're likely to identify in a given experience based on the number of participants you run. UR teams tend to focus on the area at five and above because beyond this, the curve approaches an asymptote where you've theoretically identified nearly all of the issues. For example, on our team, we normally aim to get data from about six participants. And as a result, for a full usability study, we schedule eight to nine in case of no-shows. That sets us up to identify 90 to 98% of issues in the study. Similarly, Wright is predicated on the assumption that if you run three participants, you can cover a clear majority of the issues. And at the end of the study, nine participants should have covered everything there is to see. But I'm here today to talk about the value of running a usability study with two participants, or maybe 40. It's hard to say. Now, let me introduce you to a light study, similar to write, but with a few key differences. It's defined by the following features. The first is a low sample size, two participants per study. The second is a rapid turnaround with reports within a day or two following a study. And then where it really differs from write is that write assumes you're running a bespoke series of studies within a constrained time frame, say around two weeks. Light, on the other hand, follows a regular cadence, which is longitudinal and cyclical. It's designed to iterate on different topics in an ongoing fashion as needs evolve in real time. To do this, we follow a defined schedule. A study uh, every two weeks has been ideal in my experience. That gives Light the following advantages, which we can leverage to overcome the challenges I mentioned earlier by beating the Nielsen curve at its own game. The first is we can get broader coverage by maximizing our ability to cover different systems on demand and leveraging spontaneous opportunities to iterate and build up observations on core systems. The second is a regular flow of data. With the regular cadence and a standardized schedule, it's easier to fit onto chaotic calendars. Four hours every other week to watch participants, one hour meeting every week to debrief and plan studies. This regular flow also feeds into flexibility with accountability. We get flexibility by making a commitment that we will always do something, which helps make sure we don't just cancel when the team misses a deadline. If a team can't deliver a build that's good for the expected topic, that can be fine. We can figure out a way to run something, even a competitive usability or a player interview if there's no build available at all. 
so it can be adapted to meet a team's needs in real time, but it also lends itself well to ongoing tracking of issues and iteration. The schedule here is an example for my current project, which I'll talk more about in a bit. For this project, I have a weekly planning and debrief meeting on Thursdays. A light cycle starts with a meeting to identify the topic for the next study. After that, I have two days to review the build, figure out a rough first pass on a task list, and report any potential blockers to test. Test has two days to repro my issues and file bugs. At the next meeting with the team, we talk through the potential blockers. Can they address them in time? Can we work around them? If not, we can hammer out a backup plan based on something that we know will work. Then I have two days to get my hands on a final UR build and fine tune my task list. On Tuesday, I run two participants. Then on Wednesday, I ship the report. That gives the team most of Thursday to read the report before our meeting to debrief and save 10 to 15 minutes at the end to talk about the topic for the next study. And then it goes on and on and on from there. The genesis of this idea, um, at least in our hands, came at a time when Xbox started developing a lot of Kinect games aimed at kids, which led to some basic challenges. There was a critical need for primary research about how kids interacted with the Kinect and with games in general. Many of the teams were used to designing games for adults, but kids are really different from adults. You can't just make content for a one to four scale model of a normal adult and assume the audience will engage with it the way you expect them to. At the same time, it's hard to get kids in the lab on a regular basis for lots of obvious reasons. This resulted in a need for the team to collaborate in a way that maximized the benefit we could receive from each child participant, rather than treat it like a zero sum game and compete for the scarce resource or hoarding them all for one title. The solution was Kids Thursday. Every week or two, the team would bring three to five child participants in to share amongst the URs working on kid titles. One UR would run the sessions and write up the report. The various URs would negotiate topics based on their current needs and the build availability. When topic gaps arose, other URs could fill in or the team could pivot to other options like competitive usabilities. This study ran for 34 weeks and collected feedback from around 120 child participants on 19 different products. If they had just focused on standard usability, each product could have maybe gotten one study with six participants. The insights they covered were frequently in areas that applied to multiple titles at the same time. This enabled them to leverage insights across the different teams. Many of them were issues that teams might never have guessed if they hadn't specifically focused on children. For example, one early study included a Flora's Lava style party game. And one of the key findings was that when they see themselves on a screen next to a pool of lava, kids don't try to run away. They just jump in and start splashing around in it. My first encounter with this method was when I was working on Crackdown 3. This was a systems-focused game, with a lot of systems that were designed to evolve over time. As a result, the experience of a player during the first two hours would be quite different from a player 10 or 20 hours in. This was also a project that had been on fire for a long time. As such, there was a lot of chaos when planning out builds. At times, basic systems that we wanted to cover in a usability study were lacking. At other times, new systems would show up completely unannounced, and sometimes they just struggled to deliver a functional build on a deadline. The team was also based in the UK, so we had minimal crossover for meeting opportunities, and most of those were already booked. This made it a struggle just to schedule meetings to plan or debrief UR studies. The solution for this was an ongoing usability study. We brought in two participants every other week, and this enabled us to get coverage across lots of systems which built up over time. The topics were driven by availability. After each study, we knew we would be running another in two weeks. This enabled us to plan in real time based on what we knew would be high pry and ready to go. Finally, we used short, easily consumable reports. This lowered the threshold for the team to engage. And when they were feeling underwater, this left them an opening to just send one or two sentence responses with a potential topic for next time. The chart on the right here shows the number of topics that were covered by a given number of participants. This illustrates two things. The first is, not every problem requires the same amount of attention. 11 topics we covered once, and we never touched them again. The bite-sized approach allowed us to go broader. We were able to cover topics like mouse and keyboard controls or color blindness that we could never have fit into the framework of a full usability study. And the second is there are core systems that most players will encounter in most interactions with the product, and we can collect more feedback through longitudinal iteration. By the end, we had run 36 participants, covered 28 topics, and 10 of them had gotten feedback from at least six participants. For example, platforming was a key system in the game. As a result, we were able to collect feedback on the system with 16 participants, and we needed to. This helped because it gave the team lots of opportunities to iterate on a core mechanic, 
and also because it broke in different ways in different places. Many of the usability issues with platforming were issues with level design, which meant that although some could be solved with universal fixes, they also benefited from the chance to identify new issues anytime a participant engaged with a new part of the game. So finally, I'm going to talk about my current project. This is an unannounced title, so I can't really go into too much detail about it. However, it has a lot of elements that make it a great fit for Light, following the processes I've already described. The first is it has a lot of systems. It's a game designed to adapt and provide customized experiences. So different players will engage with different systems on different time frames based on their own unique gameplay style. The second is it's a long game. Players won't encounter some systems until after hours of gameplay. And then finally, the team was already behind before COVID. The transition to work from home magnified that, and they've never really been able to catch up. This makes it hard to predict when features will be ready or when the team will have time to iterate on them. In the end, this light study ran a total of 25 participants across 13 sessions. And in that time, we identified 113 issues at a steady clip with no end in sight. This blue line on the left shows the number of test users I ran, paired with the number of usability issues identified over time. If we compare it to the Nielsen curve, it confirms what I said at the beginning of the talk. The Nielsen curve breaks down for products that require a mastery of complex systems over longer periods of time. Even though the Nielsen curve predicts that the usability problems identified will reach an asymptote before you hit 15 participants, that wasn't the case for my product. This does lead to some questions, however. Does the curve for light ever reach asymptote? This blue line looks like it could magically go on forever. Is that a trap? Where would the 100% line ultimately land? Another way to think about this is, if you can keep identifying issues, why not just keep collecting data forever? or at least until the product ships. When would you want to stop running a light study? The answer is complicated, because how long you can keep getting quality out of a light study depends on a lot of variables. The product itself, the phase of development, when new features are getting added. And that makes it hard to come up with a universal rule of thumb that predicts your sample size, or clear obvious time to point to as the time to stop. This means that there is a risk here. Running an instance of a light study is much lower effort and lower cost than other approaches to usability, but it's not zero cost. So with a commitment to keep running sessions and a lack of a clearly defined endpoint, one could keep running sessions past the time when it would be more impactful to put it on pause or move on to other methods. But there are signals you can pay attention to that will help you understand when you've hit that point. The first piece is, as I mentioned earlier, light naturally lends itself to tracking issues and whether they get resolved. For this product, any time I would do a debrief, I would track whether or not the team was aligned on each issue. Issues that we aligned on would be filed in Visual Studio, and I worked with the team to create queries that could track the issues identified in UR studies. Over time, the team started to accumulate usability debt in the product, and we started to see many of the same issues recur from session to session. We see that quantified here. By the end of the light study, many of the issues identified over time had been closed out but nearly 40% were either new and had not been assigned or were actively assigned to someone without a clear resolution in place. Even though the team was aligned that they were issues and that they did need to be resolved, they didn't have the bandwidth to actually implement the fixes. And as known usability issues piled up from session to session, it became harder and harder to work around the previously known issues that were still in place. As a result of the accumulated usability debt, even though we hadn't reached the traditional asymptote shown in the Nielsen curve or coming out of a right study, one where we stopped identifying new issues entirely, we did find that the severity of issues was asymptotic over time, particularly in the absence of iteration to close out previously identified issues. As such, issue severity can be a useful canary to pay attention to in your coal mine, particularly if you don't have the opportunity to track UR issues and tracking software that you share with your team. If issue sev is decreasing over time, that suggests that the value you're getting out of your research investment is going down over time as well. In this case, it was a sign that it was time to put the light study on pause. As I dove further into the tracking data towards the end of the light study, a third concern came up. When running a usability study in its purest form, ideally you're only identifying platonically pure usability issues, observations that reveal issues in how real users engage with the design of a product as properly implemented. But in practice, I don't know about you, but for me, that isn't always the case. And that underlies the third concern. Because the product was carrying a substantial amount of usability and technical debt, 
When I started going through issues with the team, I found that we were identifying a substantial amount of issues that were technical in origin, originating from bugs or features that weren't fully implemented. We did track those as UR issues as well to help the team understand what to prioritize to facilitate data collection. And you can see the result in the chart here. Those gray bars are the same ones I was showing earlier, showing all of the UR issues, but those blue bars are the ones that are just the actual usability issues we were identifying. As we tracked UR issue resolution over time, I noticed a concerning trend. UR issues coming out of bugs were consistently closed and resolved at much higher rates than more pure usability issues that required design iteration. It's easy to understand why. The bugs were often more bite-sized, and the team already had the infrastructure in place to track, assign, and close them out. But this also confirmed my feelings of usability debt and told me that the team needed more time to catch up on design iteration to close out more usability issues. Which is to say, this is how I knew for sure that it was time to put the light study on pause and negotiate with the team what level of progress we needed to see in terms of closing out those issues before we can start running more participants. And that leads into my conclusion. Long-term iterative testing and evaluation, or LIGHT, is an approach to usability that is defined by a low sample size, a rapid turnaround to reports, and a regular ongoing study cadence. It facilitates broader topic coverage, a regular flow of data, and provides study flexibility while promoting accountability. And it can provide better results than writer standard usability for projects that have complex systems that are in chaotic states or where usability beats just feel like risky high value opportunities. And finally, for optimal efficiency, track your issues so you can attend to the level of usability debt, the issue severity over time, and whether your team is closing out usability issues or just bugs. And that's all I have to say for today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me at joehri at microsoft.com. It's on the slide here. And I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming and listening to the talk today.